The Battle of Poitiers, which occurred on September 19, 1356, was a significant conflict in the Hundred Years' War between the French and the English. The battle unfolded in western France, about five miles south of Poitiers. It pitted a French army led by King John II against an Anglo-Gascon force commanded by Edward, the Black Prince. Around 14,000 to 16,000 French troops launched an attack on a strong defensive position held by 6,000 Anglo-Gascons. The Black Prince, the heir to the English throne, embarked on a major campaign in southwest France, 19 years after the war's commencement. His forces marched towards the River Loire but couldn't cross it. King John quickly assembled a large and mobile army, pursuing the Anglo-Gascons and forcing them into battle. The Anglo-Gascons took up a robust defensive position near Poitiers, and when negotiations failed, the battle began. The first French assault involved heavily armored cavalry units, a sizable contingent of crossbowmen, and infantry. However, they were pushed back by the Anglo-Gascons, who fought on foot. A subsequent French attack led by 4,000 foot men-at-arms, commanded by John's son and heir Charles, also failed. French ranks became chaotic after the Dauphin's division retreated, about half of the men under Philip, Duke of Orleans, including all four of John's sons, left the field. Some of those who remained launched a weak third assault, which also didn't succeed. The remaining French forces rallied around the king for a fourth assault against the exhausted Anglo-Gascons, who were also fighting on foot. The French unfurled their sacred banner, the Oriflamme, signaling no mercy to be shown. The battle intensified, with the French initially gaining ground. Unexpectedly, a small mounted Anglo-Gascon force of 160 men, previously sent to threaten the French rear, appeared behind the French lines. This created a sense of being surrounded, causing panic and eventually the collapse of the French forces. King John was captured, along with one of his sons and many men-at-arms. An estimated 2,500 French men-at-arms were killed, and around 1,500 to 3,800 French common infantry were either killed or taken captive. The surviving French scattered, while the Anglo-Gascons retreated to Gascony. In the aftermath, a two-year truce was established, and the Black Prince escorted King John to London. The battle triggered populist revolts across France, leading to negotiations that eventually resulted in the Treaty of Bretigny in 1360. This treaty saw England gaining control over significant areas of France and King John being ransomed. However, the war continued in 1369, with the French recapturing much of the lost territory. The war finally concluded in 1453 with a French victory. Since the Norman conquest of England in 1066, English monarchs held titles and territories within France, which made them vassals to the French kings. By the early 14th century, the only significant French land remaining under English control was Gascony in the southwest. Despite its size, Gascony was immensely important due to the substantial duty imposed by the English crown on wine from Bordeaux, its capital. This duty constituted the largest portion of state income, surpassing all other customs duties combined. Bordeaux's population exceeded 50,000, even surpassing London's, making it possibly richer too. The Hundred Years' War, lasting 116 years, began in 1337 due to conflicts between Philip VI of France and Edward III of England. Philip's Great Council decided to reclaim the lands held by Edward III in France, alleging Edward's breach of vassal obligations. While Gascony was the initial cause, Edward III had limited resources for its defense. Typically, Gascon forces numbered 3,000 to 6,000, primarily infantry, with many required to defend fortifications. In 1345 and 1346, Henry, Earl of Lancaster, led successful Anglo-Gascon campaigns in Aquitaine, shifting the conflict away from central Gascony. The English captured the French port of Calais in August 1347 after the Cressy campaign. A truce of Calais was signed, as both nations were financially drained. The Black Death, which struck in the same year, caused significant devastation, leading to a temporary pause in the fighting. Though a treaty to end the war was negotiated and signed in 1354, internal shifts within the French King's Council caused sentiment to turn against its terms. Consequently, both sides geared up for full-scale war from the summer of 1355. In April of that year, Edward III, with favorable finances, 
decided to launch offensives in northern France and Gascony. While John II of France attempted to bolster his defenses and field an army, he struggled due to financial constraints, leading to his inability to heavily garrison his northern towns and fortifications against Edward III's anticipated attack. In 1355, Edward III's eldest son, Edward of Woodstock, who became famously known as the Black Prince, assumed command in Gascony. He started gathering troops, supplies, and ships for his campaign. Arriving in Bordeaux on September 20, he was officially recognized as the king's lieutenant in Gascony the following day, with significant authority granted by Gascon officials. The Black Prince's forces grew with the reinforcement of Gascon nobles, numbering between 5,000 and 6,000, along with a bridging train and ample supply train. Setting out on October 5, they embarked on a chevauché, a large-scale mounted raid. Over the course of 300 miles to Narbonne and back, they wreaked havoc across French territory, sacking towns and causing substantial economic damage. Their return journey covered 675 miles and concluded on December 2. In 1356, English forces resumed their offensive from Gascony after Christmas. Over the next four months, they captured over 50 French-held towns or fortifications, including key locations near Gascony's borders and even more distant sites. Local French commanders did little to counter these advances, while the English managed to gain allegiance from some local French nobility. In France, money and enthusiasm for the war were waning. The French administration was marred by internal conflicts, leading to a breakdown in cohesion. The people's discontent with King John's rule was evident as rebellions erupted in various regions. The French nobles of Normandy refused to pay taxes, and King John's attempt to quell opposition through arrests and executions only exacerbated tensions. Taking advantage of the turmoil, Edward III redirected an expedition initially planned for Brittany to Normandy. Led by Henry of Lancaster, this force pillaged and burned its way across Normandy, inflicting damage on the French economy and bolstering English alliances. Despite King John's efforts to intercept the English, Lancaster's campaign managed to seize loot, forge new alliances, and weaken the French king's position. In response, King John returned to Breteuil to continue the siege, remaining unaware of the English preparations for a larger-scale chevauché from the southwest of France. In August 1356, a combined Anglo-Gascon force of 6,000 soldiers moved north from Bergerac, accompanied by around 4,000 non-combatants. All fighting men, including foot soldiers like archers, were mounted. By August 14, the Anglo-Gascon army split into three divisions, each moving north in parallel, systematically causing destruction in their wake. This strategic arrangement allowed them to cover a wide area of French territory while still being capable of uniting quickly against any threat. Their progression was marked by deliberate destruction, with strong castles captured and towns abandoned by their populace in the face of the Anglo-Gascon advance. This destruction was conducted methodically, affecting France economically and weakening morale. The French, however, didn't have a significant field army in the vicinity to challenge them. John, the French king, remained focused on the siege of Breteuil, although it was apparent that this siege was not yielding any fruitful results. In an effort to halt the devastation in the southwest of France, John eventually allowed the garrison of Breteuil to leave the town, prompting the French army to march south to counter the Anglo-Gascon threat. By late August, news reached the Black Prince that John was advancing towards Tours and willing to engage in battle. The Black Prince reorganized his forces and prepared for the French arrival. He still aimed to cross the Loire River to link up with other English forces and confront the French army. John's army, now reinforced and mostly composed of mounted troops, moved southwest alongside the Loire River. The Black Prince's forces reached Tours and expected the French to arrive soon for battle. Unbeknownst to the Black Prince, John had already crossed the Loire and was heading towards them. However, the expected reinforcements from England did not arrive as planned. An Aragonese galley fleet caused panic among the English, hampering the assembly of troops. Additionally, Lancaster's attempt to join forces with the Black Prince was hindered by the high water levels of the Loire and French control over its bridges. As a result, Lancaster returned to Brittany. The Anglo-Gascon army aimed to force the French to engage in battle by threatening widespread devastation. While they spread out for looting, 
Their main strategy was to lure the French into attacking on unfavorable terms. They believed they could defeat a numerically superior French force on ground of their choosing or maneuver to avoid battle if necessary. On the French side, John sought to cut off the Anglo-Gascons from Gascony and force them into a battle. The Black Prince aimed to remain in the vicinity of the French army to encourage them to attack without putting his own forces at risk. He anticipated that the French would be eager for battle, given their enthusiasm to engage Lancaster's force earlier that year. After crossing the Loire and being reinforced, John aimed to cut off the Anglo-Gascon retreat. The Black Prince, realizing that Lancaster wouldn't be able to join him, shifted his army south to Montbazon to establish a fresh defensive position on September 12. Meanwhile, John's son Charles, the Dauphin, arrived at Tours with 1,000 men-at-arms, and Cardinal Heli de Talleyrand Perigord attempted to negotiate a truce on behalf of Pope Innocent VI. The proposed truce was to be followed by peace talks or a battle. However, the Black Prince, eager for battle and concerned about being cornered without supplies, rejected the truce proposal and swiftly moved his forces south, crossing the river Cruz at La Haye on September 13. Similarly, John was determined to engage in battle and ignored Talleyrand's negotiations. As both armies moved south in parallel, the Black Prince's scouts informed him that John was about to cross the Vienne River. Recognizing the chance to engage the French army, the Black Prince departed his position to intercept them on September 17, leaving his baggage train behind. At Chauvigny, a portion of the French rearguard was ambushed by the Anglo-Gascons, leading to a swift rout of the unarmored French forces. Most of the French army had already crossed the Vienne River and was heading towards Poitiers. The Black Prince held back his army from pursuing too far and camped at savigny leverscourt On September 18, the Anglo-Gascons moved towards Poitiers in battle formation. They positioned themselves strategically in a wooded hill in the Foray d'en Whale, about five miles south of Poitiers, readying defensive measures such as pits, trenches, and barricades to deter the French advance. The Anglo-Gascons hoped the French would launch an attack. Instead of an immediate assault, Cardinal Talleyrand approached the Black Prince to negotiate. Initially reluctant to delay the battle, the Black Prince agreed to discussions upon realizing that the armies were too close to each other. Talleyrand emphasized that the Anglo-Gascons might find it difficult to withdraw if the French didn't attack, facing possible defeat in detail if attacked, or running out of supplies if they held their position, the Anglo-Gascons were compelled to engage in negotiations. After extended talks, the Black Prince offered significant concessions for safe passage to Gascony, but this agreement required approval from his father, Edward III. Unbeknownst to the French, Edward had already granted his son permission to make truce arrangements. The French debated the proposal, with John initially in favor but later persuaded to pursue battle. The French suggested different sites for the battle, as they wanted the Anglo-Gascons to leave their defensive position, while the English aimed to retain it. On September 19, Talleyrand once again tried to arrange a truce, but the Black Prince rejected it, aware that the French supplies were dwindling and the opportunity for negotiation was diminishing. The stage was set for the decisive Battle of Poitiers. The Anglo-Gascon army, according to modern historians, is estimated to have comprised around 6,000 soldiers. This force consisted of 3,000 men-at-arms, 2,000 English and Welsh longbowmen, and 1,000 Gascon infantry. Some accounts suggest slightly lower numbers, such as 4,800 or 5,000. While the exact division between English and Gascon men-at-arms isn't specified, Historical context indicates that about 1,000 of the prince's men-at-arms were likely English. The men-at-arms were essentially knights or those in training, drawn from the landed gentry. They ranged from high-ranking lords to relatives and companions of minor landowners. They wore armor including a quilted gambesine beneath male armor that covered their bodies and limbs. Plate armor was added to varying extents depending on wealth and experience. They wore bassinet helmets with a movable visor for face protection. They carried heater shields made of wood and leather. English men-at-arms fought on foot, using weapons like pikes, short spears made from shortened lances, swords, and battle axes. The English and Welsh archers were equipped with the longbow, a unique weapon that required years to master. 
Skilled archers could shoot up to 10 arrows per minute over long distances. Computer analysis in recent years has shown that their heavy bodkin point arrows could penetrate typical plate armor at shorter ranges, with the ability to pierce even the best quality armor at close range and the right angle. Archers carried one quiver of 24 arrows, and some arrows might have been retrieved from the battlefield during pauses in the fighting. The Anglo-Gascon army was organized into three divisions or battles. The left flank was commanded by Thomas, Earl of Warwick, who had previously been a guardian to the Black Prince and a veteran of the Battle of Cressy. His division, comprising approximately 1,000 men at arms and archers, was assisted by John, Earl of Oxford, and Gascon Lord Jean, capital de Bouc. The archers were positioned on the left of the men at arms. The right flank was led by William, Earl of Salisbury, with deputies Robert, Earl of Suffolk, and Morris, Baron Berkeley. Salisbury's division also had around 1,000 men at arms and 1,000 archers. The archers were positioned on the right flank of the men at arms. The center division, commanded by the Black Prince, consisted of men at arms and Gascon infantry, each numbering around 1,000. Only the flanking divisions had longbowmen. John Chandos and James Audley, experienced campaigners, served as deputies for the Black Prince. Initially, the Prince's division was kept in reserve behind the other two. Each division was deployed in a formation of four to five men deep. Additionally, there might have been a small reserve behind the Prince's division. At the break of dawn, around 5.40 a.m., the French army, numbering between 14,000 and 16,000 men, formed their battle order about 500 yards away from the English positions. After approximately two hours of facing each other, the French perceived movement among the English, believing that the Black Prince's standard was retreating. The exact nature of this movement is debated among modern scholars. Some propose that it could have been the movement of wagons escorted by cavalry, possibly empty wagons returning to the rear, or a feigned withdrawal by the English to provoke a French attack. This movement prompted the French to advance, assuming it was a full-scale English withdrawal. The French leaders ordered their men to pursue what they thought was a retreating English force, igniting the battle. The French army was divided into four divisions or battles. Arnold Dordrum's cavalry attacked the left flank of Warwick's division. However, the English archers in this division were positioned near a marsh, preventing the French cavalry from engaging them effectively. The French cavalry was clad in armor that hindered the English archers' shots. The archers targeted the French crossbowmen supporting the cavalry, suppressing their fire due to their higher rate of fire. To counter the French cavalry, the archers attacked from a position where they could shoot at the unprotected hindquarters of the horses. This tactic inflicted significant casualties on the French cavalry, leading to their withdrawal. Audrum was captured during this engagement. Jean de Clermont advanced more cautiously on the English right flank. He discovered that the English men-at-arms were defending a thick hedge with a narrow gap. Despite being committed to the attack, the French attempted to breach the hedge defended by the English. English archers stationed near the hedge and Gascon crossbowmen in trenches provided a barrage of arrows, effectively repelling the French cavalry's attempt. As the French cavalry reached the gap, a close-quarters melee ensued. The combination of archer fire, crossbow fire, and the English men-at-arms forced the French cavalry to retreat with significant losses, including the death of Clermont. The French division led by Walter, Count of Brienne, consisted of a mixture of French and foreign men-at-arms, along with common heavy infantry. They were supported by crossbowmen. The crossbow bolts from their own side were dense, but the English longbowmen turned their fire on them. With the French cavalry repelled, the longbowmen's rapid rate of fire was highly effective, forcing the French division to withdraw, despite their use of pavises, large shields. During this attack, Brienne, the constable of France, was killed, and Douglas, the Scottish leader, either fled to safety or was severely wounded. The repulsion of the first French division's attack was primarily attributed to the English longbowmen's effective fire. Many modern historians believe that the longbowmen played a crucial role in repelling the assault. The Black Prince was angered by the involvement of Talleyrand's relatives and associates, and he initially ordered the beheading of a relative of the Cardinal. However, he withdrew this order following advice from his advisers. The battle was far from over. The engagements on that day continued, and further developments would shape the outcome of the Battle of Poitiers.
After the repulsion of the first French division's assault, the English did not pursue the retreating French survivors. Instead, they held their positions, allowing time for reformation. The next French division, consisting of 4,000 men, launched a vigorous attack. The French soldiers advanced while enduring steady fire from the English and Welsh archers. This fire caused significant casualties among the French and disrupted their ranks due to the remnants of the previous assault. The French had to push through the hedge that the English were defending, which placed them at a disadvantage. Despite this, the French engaged the Anglo-Gascons in intense hand-to-hand -hand combat that lasted for about two hours. The French massed against gaps in the hedge and managed to break through once. However, a coordinated counterattack by the Anglo-Gascons, aided by archer fire, repelled the French advance. During this phase, William de Bowen, Earl of Northampton, rode behind the Anglo-Gascon line, offering guidance, directing reinforcements, and coordinating archer fire. The Anglo-Gascon commanders displayed flexibility and adeptly maneuvered their troops during the battle. In contrast, the French commanders followed their orders rigidly, and although their soldiers fought bravely, they lacked adaptability. The Anglo-Gascon's ability to respond swiftly to changing situations in the heat of battle played a pivotal role. Following the failure of the second French attack, confusion spread among the French ranks. The third French division, commanded by John's brother, the Duke of Orleans, consisted of 3,200 men at arms. Orleans withdrew from the battle with half of his troops and many survivors from the previous attacks. Reasons for this withdrawal vary in historical accounts. Orleans might have believed that the orderly retreat of the Dauphin's division signaled a general withdrawal. Some official accounts suggest that John ordered Orleans to protect his sons, but these were doubted and considered excuses for the retreat. Three of John's sons, including the Dauphin, left the battlefield, while Philip, another son, returned to join the final attack. Of the remaining 1,600 men who didn't retreat, many joined John's division. The rest of the French soldiers launched a feeble attack against the Anglo-Gascons, which was easily repelled. In the aftermath of this failed attack, numerous men from Warwick's division left their positions to pursue the retreating French. Their aim was likely to take prisoners for ransom, a profitable endeavor. Many archers scoured the area for more arrows. Most of the men at arms who didn't pursue were nursing various degrees of wounds sustained during the intense combat. John's 4th French division began the battle with 2,000 men at arms, including 400 hand-picked soldiers under his direct command. Survivors from the previous French attacks rallied to the King's division, as did many soldiers from the 3rd division who hadn't retreated with Orleans. These reinforcements likely brought the division's total number of men at arms to around 4,000. The division also included numerous crossbowmen, both initially and as survivors from the first attack joined their ranks. The balance of forces between the French and Anglo-Gascons at this point is debated among historians. This substantial French division, marching as infantry, closed in on the exhausted Anglo-Gascons across the one-mile-wide gap. King John unfurled the French sacred banner, the Oriflamme, signaling no quarter for the enemy on pain of death. This sight disheartened many Anglo-Gascon soldiers, who had initially thought the battle was over after overcoming three French divisions. The Anglo-Gascon command group deliberated on their options, realizing that standing against a fourth attack could lead to defeat. They devised a strategy. A small mounted force under Gascon Lord Jean, the capital de Bouc, was sent on a circuitous route to launch a surprise attack on the French rear. This maneuver further demoralized the Anglo-Gascons, who saw it as a desperate escape from impending defeat. Some men fled, fearing the incoming French assault. To prevent their army from breaking and retreating, the Black Prince ordered a general advance, bolstering Anglo-Gascon morale and unsettling the French. The Anglo-Gascons moved out of their defensive positions, and the French crossbowmen attempted to establish fire superiority as they advanced in front of the men-at-arms. Although the French crossbow bolts created a dense barrage, the English longbowmen, running low on arrows, managed to suppress the fire. However, as the French men-at-arms advanced, the crossbowmen stepped aside, allowing them to launch their final charge. As the English archers depleted their ammunition, approximately 4,000 French men-at-arms engaged in close combat with the 3,000 remaining English and Gascon men-at-arms who had started the battle. The longbowmen joined the melee, 
discarding their bows and fighting with swords and hand axes, the battle resumed with intense fighting. The French initially gained the upper hand, but the arrival of men from Warwick's division, returning from their pursuit of the retreating French, bolstered the Anglo-Gascon line, reversing the tide. Amid the conflict, Audley might have led a cavalry charge aimed at King John, further intensifying the fighting. In the midst of the battle, the capital de Bouc's force arrived undetected in the French rear. His archers dismounted and unleashed effective fire into the French rear, while his mounted men at arms charged into the back of the French line. This unexpected assault disoriented the French, whose ranks were made up of men who had joined later in the battle and were already fatigued and demoralized. Dismayed by the reinforcement and shocked by the sudden attack from the rear, some French soldiers began to flee the battlefield. This initiated a chain reaction as others followed suit, causing the division to disintegrate. While some managed to escape on horseback, many elite French soldiers were captured, including John's personal bodyguards, senior nobles, and members of the Order of the Star. The fighting was brutal as these men refused to surrender, and they were surrounded and split into small groups. Despite the hopeless situation, many of these elite French soldiers were captured rather than killed, as the Anglo-Gascons sought to ransom them. The standard bearer of the Oriflamme was killed, and the sacred banner itself was captured. Surrounded by enemies, both John and his youngest son, Philip, eventually surrendered. After the capital de Bouc's force arrived, many French soldiers who had fled managed to reach their horses and escape. As John's division retreated, many Anglo-Gascons mounted up and pursued them. A significant number chased the fleeing French soldiers toward Poitiers, hoping to find refuge within the city. However, the gates were closed, and the citizens of Poitiers, fearing the Anglo-Gascons, refused them entry. The mounted Anglo-Gascons caught up with the stranded French soldiers outside the city and inflicted heavy casualties. This indicates that those killed were likely common soldiers, as it wasn't financially beneficial to ransom them. The Anglo-Gascons overwhelmed the French camp with their cavalry and scattered in pursuit. French men-at-arms who couldn't reach their horses were captured or occasionally killed. Those who did mount their horses were often chased, with some being captured, some fending off their pursuers, and most managing to escape. The pursuit continued helter-skelter until evening when the last Anglo-Gascons returned to camp with their prisoners. Historians differ on casualty figures, but according to various sources, between 2,000 and 3,000 French men at arms and either 500 or 800 common soldiers were taken prisoner during the battle. The captured individuals included King John, his son, the Archbishop of Sens, a Marshal of France, and Seneschals of various regions. Approximately 2,500 French men at arms were killed, along with either 3,300 common soldiers according to English accounts or 700 as per French sources. Among the dead were high-ranking French figures like the King's uncle, the Grand Constable of France, the other Marshal, the Bishop of Chalon, and John's standard bearer, Geoffroy de Charny. A contemporary lamented the significant loss suffered by the French. The Anglo-Gascons reported around 40 to 60 killed, with only four of them being men-at-arms. While these figures seem low, modern sources suggest about 40 men-at-arms and an uncertain but likely larger number of bowmen and other infantry were killed. Following the battle, the victorious Anglo-Gascons took measures to tend to the wounded, bury the dead, and organize their formations. They resumed their march towards Gascony, laden with plunder and prisoners. The French feared that the Anglo-Gascons might attack nearby towns, while the Black Prince aimed to safely return his army and captives. On October 2, they reached Libourne, and a triumphant entry into Bordeaux was arranged. Two weeks later, the Black Prince escorted King John into Bordeaux amid enthusiastic celebrations. The Battle of Poitiers significantly impacted the course of the Hundred Years' War. Following the battle, English and Gascon forces continued to raid unopposed across France, causing political instability and anarchy within the country. Eventually, negotiations led to the First Treaty of London in May 1358, which aimed to end the war through territorial transfers and ransom payments. However, this treaty faltered due to financial and political challenges. Subsequent events, including peasant revolts and further military campaigns, shaped the war's progression. Ultimately, the Second Treaty of London was agreed upon, similar to the first, but negotiations with the Dauphin and the Estates General hindered its implementation. 
In 1359, Edward III led another campaign in northern France, resulting in widespread devastation. Despite these actions, both sides found it increasingly difficult to finance the war, leading to renewed negotiations. The Treaty of Bretigny was established in 1360, ceding vast areas of France to England in exchange for a substantial ransom for King John. This treaty seemed to end the conflict, but fighting resumed in 1369, extending the war until 1453. The Battle of Poitiers significantly impacted the war's trajectory and set the stage for the eventual conclusion of the Hundred Years' War.